Hi everyone, welcome and thank you for joining us for today's ASA web seminar, Maintaining Services and Support for People Living with Dementia and Their Caregivers During COVID-19, which is part of the National Alzheimer's and Dementia Resource Center webinar series sponsored by the Administration for Community Living. We'll be getting started shortly. The slides for today's presentation are available under the tab on your screen labeled Resources. And under the tab labeled CE application here, you'll find information on how to obtain CE credit for this event. You'll have 60 days to complete a continuing education application, and it may take up to 30 days from the date of your application in order for us to process and issue your CE credit. If you're not logged in directly to this webinar, that is if you're watching as part of a group and did not log in using the individual confirmation URL, you will not be eligible for continuing education credit because we have no way to track your online attendance. If you'd like to receive CE credit, please be sure you log in using the confirmation URL you received after individually registering. If you have questions during the presentation, you can send those at any time using the questions box on your screen, and we'll save those for the last 10 to 15 minutes of today's program. And now I'd like to welcome Sari Schumann of the National Alzheimer's and Dementia Resource Center. Welcome, Sari. Thanks so much, Betsy, and thank you everyone for joining us today for the third and final webinar in our COVID-19 and dementia series. Today's webinar is maintaining services and supports for people living with dementia and their caregivers during COVID-19. The National Alzheimer's and Dementia Resource Center webinar series is supported by the Administration for Community Living. Before we start the presentations, Erin Long of the Administration for Community Living will provide a brief welcome. Erin. Hi, everyone. I just want to thank you for taking time out of your very busy schedules to join us today to learn about what is happening in Williamsburg, Virginia, and in at Florida Atlantic University in um, Florida. I want to thank Drs. Jensen and Ordonez for being willing to share with us their learnings through this most challenging time. And with that, I will get, give it back to you, Siri. Thank you, Erin. And just a little more information about our presenters today. Uh, we have Christine Jensen, who is Director of Health Services Research with the Riverside Center for Excellence in Aging and Lifelong Health in Williamsburg, Virginia, and Adjunct Instructor in the Department of Gerontology at Virginia Commonwealth University. The Center for Excellence in Aging has been honored with a 2013 Commonwealth Council on Aging Best Practices Award for their work with Family Caregiver Programming, and a 2012 Best Practices Award by the Southern Gerontological Society. Dr. Jensen is a master trainer with the Rosalind Carter Institute for Caregiving and was named the 2015 Applied Gerontologist of the Year by the Southern Gerontological Society. Her current work focuses on programming and training to support family and professional caregivers. Dr. Maria Ordonez is a board-certified gerontological and psychiatric mental health nurse practitioner who specializes in caring for the older adult through diagnosis, treatment, and management of acute and chronic conditions that are gener generally associated with aging. Her practice focuses on transforming healthcare environments by providing culturally responsive and linguistically appropriate, caring, science-based interventions for aging populations that are dedicated to meeting the needs of the underserved minority communities. Dr. Odonez is also a member of the National Alzheimer's Project Act Advisory Council. At this time, I will turn things over to Christy and Maria for their presentations. Christy, take it away. Thanks, Sari. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm really pleased to be with you today and to share some of our approaches to handling clinical services and grant work uh, during a pandemic. I know that many of you on the line today have been faced with making program changes, and I'm hopeful that what Maria and I share with you today will be of some help, and we also look forward to learning about some of your strategies and adjustments. First, I'd like to thank the Administration for Community Living for providing funding support, and particularly for their patience uh, since the spring uh, in helping us to respond to these grant-funded initiatives um, in light of uh, the challenges we were facing with the pandemic. So specifically, uh, for the next uh, few minutes, I'd like to uh, explain to you how our clinical services here at our center were altered uh, because of the pandemic, 
And of course, um, it appears that we are moving into what some are calling a third wave uh, right now with the virus. And so um, we will be able to lean back on the adjustments that we made in the spring um, and, and likely need to uh, revisit those um, in light of what we are, are seeing really nationwide right now. So I wanted to take just a minute, Erin mentioned that we're based in Williamsburg, Virginia, so I want to take a few minutes to share with you a little bit about our center. We're part of a larger health system, and also then to highlight some of the challenges and opportunities that the pandemic has presented to us um, to help us in supporting persons living with dementia and their family and professional caregivers. So this slide shows you uh, just a brief kind of uh, snapshot of um, how we uh, describe our center. So we are in Virginia, we're in the eastern part of the state, and we are part of a larger health system, the Riverside Health System. And within our center, we are supporting the entire health system, and in many cases, our programs are supporting um, the Commonwealth of Virginia as a whole. But we have three main components, health services research, which uh, does much of the grant work, services that promote wellness, including our clinical services, and I'll explain those a little further, and then the community engagement. And in reality, all, of, all three of these really link and blend uh, pretty nicely together. And so the green bar to the right just highlights this dementia wellness and training project um, that is funded by ACL and that I'll be speaking with you about a little bit more today. So this is the funding through the Alzheimer's Disease Program Initiative, ADPI, and um, we have really two overarching objectives, one around dementia wellness and one around uh, dementia training. And so let me just uh, unpack both of those briefly. Uh, with the wellness, dementia wellness, these are our clinical services. And so I'm going to be sharing with you a little bit about our comprehensive medication reviews, our care consultation program, and programs that foster social connections. And then on the right side where you see training listed, I'll be explaining a little bit more about microlearning. This is a tool that we've found to have great utility in translating content to an online learning format. It just so happened that we deployed this online learning tool about a month before the pandemic. And also, um, that we have been delivering uh, staff development and professional training by integrating the content of both motivational interviewing and TIPA Snow education uh, using the positive approach to care. And that training has targeted our home care staff and, and social workers here in our health system uh, and in the community at large in particular. So it looks like a lot in this uh, flow chart, but bear with me and let me walk you through uh, the chart. So the, the good news is what this is showing is that there are a lot of ways that once we uh, connect with a person living with dementia and or their family caregiver that we can link them with um, a variety of uh, clinical services and uh, community programs. So starting on the left, we do have two clinics within our health system that are specifically targeted to serve persons with memory loss, our geriatric assessment clinic and our memory care clinic. They're not quite identical, but we consider them sister clinics. Um, one is housed here in our center in Williamsburg, and the other is housed in a neurology practice about 30 minutes away um, within our health system region. So individuals that serve that clinic are made up of a multidisciplinary team, and they now offer, thanks to grant funding, an additional member of the team, and that's a pharmacist. And so that's where you see the comprehensive medication review um, that's made available. And another member of that team is a dementia care consultant. So we use the Benjamin Rose Institute on Aging Evidence-Based Care Consultation Program to make a care consultant available uh, where needed. And so these clinics essentially serve as a funnel in to receiving these additional services we did not have before, that of a pharmacist and that of a dementia care consultant. And interestingly, while the family caregiver isn't a patient at our clinic, they are a key part of the team. They are treated as such, and they really benefit from the education in particular that's provided through the comprehensive uh, medication review. In fact, we had a uh, family caregivers sitting down with the pharmacist and with the loved one that um, she was providing care for. And when the pharmacist reviewed the husband's medications and made some recommendations, 
um, to try to de de prescribe in a few areas. Uh, the wife followed by saying, gosh, this was not only was this really valuable for my husband that I'm caring for, but I actually think I need you to do the same kind of review uh, with my medication. So again, they're not the patient, but we are trying to provide a great deal of education and support uh, for the family caregivers. And on the right, where you see specifically the family caregivers, they are invited along with the individual that they're providing care for to our memory cafe. Um, to foster more social connections, and I'll explain in just a minute how that's been impacted over the past few months. And they're invited to participate in the micro-learning lessons, those online lessons that I mentioned earlier. I'll explain a little bit more detail and show you one of the flyers that we use to promote that. So here I just wanted to kind of give you a sense that um, we, in, in aiming to serve more than 1,000 individuals with memory loss, or their family and professional caregivers that were well on our way about three quarters of the way through this grant uh, period and through serving individuals. In fact, we have already exceeded uh, our targets for reaching uh, professional staff and are really, believe, really pleased by that. Um, this is uh, a compilation of numbers from the first two years of our three years of a ADPI funding. And you know, fortunately, programs like the Benjamin Rose Institute Care Consultation Program and microlearning can be easily accessed uh, even as we were dealing with the pandemic. So let me highlight a few challenges. For medication review and care consultation, as I mentioned earlier when we looked at the chart, um, individuals are um, able to access those services um, when they come in through our clinics. And what happened in mid-March um, is that we had to close both of those clinics. And um, we opened up one clinic just several weeks later, which we were very proud to do in early April, and the second clinic opened back up later in April. Uh, so I'll, I'll come back to how that um, impacted our ability to serve our patients and to connect them to these other grant-funded initiatives. With Memory Cafe, and, and if you're not familiar, this really is a, is a social opportunity that is less structured, um, kind of like a Starbucks experience in a more safe environment where everyone understands um, the dementia uh, diagnosis and kind of puts that to the side when they walk in the door just to be together. And so the, the meeting space, the libraries, the churches where we've held our memory cafes, you know, that's what the participants strongly associated with being at a cafe. And so it really then became our challenge when those libraries and churches and other public places we were using for cafes closed, how are we going to continue to maintain that kind of connection and give that cafe experience to those dyads? So in terms of some adaptations and successes, for um, the clinic services, we did prepare and send out shortly after our clinics closed uh, what we called a reassurance letter. So we explained uh, the new protocols that every patient and family member who comes in would be subjected to a temperature check, would be expected to have their mask on. We explained a lot of our distancing and cleaning procedures. In fact, our team here spent time reworking furniture in our lobby um, and, and making sure patients understood that we actually were going to expect them to wait in their car, let us know when they arrived to the clinic, and then we would uh, bring them in. Uh, when appropriate to do so. We also limited the number of family members that could come in with a patient. And we have had times where a patient would come in with four or five family members for their appointment. And while we generally would appreciate this and are pleased to work with the entire family unit, um, in this case, we did limit it to one family member to be uh, with the patient. The phone and email check-ins became critical. And so while these individuals were told that the clinic was closed and their appointments had been delayed, we were able to check in with them regularly and make them aware of other programs that were still going on that included things like the microlearning lessons. For care consultation, interestingly enough, is that it is uh, rooted in uh, a phone and email structure. So it was already um, going to be more easily managed uh, during the pandemic. 
Um, we did find that there was a slowdown of referrals during that time because the individuals weren't coming into the clinic. But what our dementia care consultant that leads that program told us is that the dyads were more accessible. They were more likely to be at home. And so she was able to stay in better contact with them, particularly during the height of the, the first wave. For our memory cafe, uh, our coordinator uh, engaged in weekly calls and emails with individuals once we realized that the public sites I had mentioned had been closed. And one uh, fascinating activity that she shared with uh, her dyads was, and they participated in this together, was that they did an online tour of the Chrysler Museum, uh, which is a pretty well-known uh, museum here in Norfolk, Virginia. Uh, and, and so she really was creative in trying to do some activities together and that could be done uh, safely online. We transitioned to a virtual cafe. I'll show you the flyer that we developed for that. We also incorporated a, a pen pal program. And part of the reason that we did that was that our volunteers um, who support the Memory Cafe now didn't have a place to go and volunteer. Um, and so they could join the virtual sessions, but they were also looking for other ways to be of support. And so they started a pen pal email program to stay in touch with the dyads that they're no, they were no longer able to see in the cafe type setting. And I really appreciated the opportunity that ACL afforded us as we connected with uh, Beth Solzberg. She is an Alzheimer's Family Support Program Director at Jewish Family and Children's Services in Massachusetts, and she oversees um, uh, memory cafes in Massachusetts. And she was extremely helpful to us transitioning our cafe to a virtual platform because she had been doing this prior to the pandemic. And she also connected us with other cafes in Massachusetts and in Texas and Utah specifically to learn a little bit more about how they were handling that transition. So here is an image of our uh, memory cafe flyer that we created to transition to the virtual delivery. In fact, our coordinator is holding a cafe next week that she's calling her gratitude cafe so that she can, uh, in this season of Thanksgiving, thank all of her dyads for participating during all these uh, challenging times. Twiddlemuffs. I wanted to take just a minute to share with you about Twiddlemuffs. I'm not sure if you're familiar with them. They, it is originated out of the UK, and as you can see, they're brightly colored. Um, they are warm and comforting, and they are intended for individuals with memory loss or others who have um, frustration around agitation in particular. And so we wanted to do more during the pandemic to support our program participants as well as residents and staff in the long-term care settings that are a part of our health system here. And we had received a few twiddle muffs from the Williamsburg Knitting Guild uh, to provide the patients who came into our clinic here. And we've had those on hand for probably the past uh, 18 to 24 months. But we reached out to the Williamsburg Knitting Guild and we asked if we could expand the distribution of these and they enthusiastically supported us. And I bet we have an additional uh, 100 or so here, plus we've been able to distribute them to um, the Memory Cafe participants and our long-term care facilities, our adult day program here, uh, and to patients who are coming into the clinics and our program. So we're really proud of that. And we also um, perfected the cleaning procedures for uh, these twiddle muffs as well. Here's the flyer that we use to promote our micro-learning lessons. And we have a partnership with Virginia Navigator. This is a statewide portal for aging-related services, and we built a library, an e-learning platform on their site, and that hosts these 10 lessons that we call Caring for You, Mind, Body, and Soul. And those lessons were inspired by the Rosalind Carter Institute Caring for You, Caring for Me signature program. As I wrap up, I want to share just a few more images with you. These are some of my teammates. They gave me permission to share their images. And so one thing we have been testing in our clinic are the clear view window masks. And so these colleagues of mine on the far left is our dementia care consultant, our geriatric assessment clinic coordinator in the middle, and our geriatrician on the right. And um, really, they, they um, referred to this uh, approach as a let me see you smile. 
uh, kind of philosophy. And, and um, it, I think, was beneficial to them uh, as members of the interdisciplinary team as well as to the patients that come in and their family members. So on this image, you see our nurse on the left and our pharmacist on the right. And we've received quite a bit of positive feedback from both patients and families uh, about just their ability to better see when the member of the team is speaking with them and, even more importantly, uh, when they're smiling and providing that level of reassurance. So in sum, here are a few of the lessons that we learned. Even when our clinics reopened in the spring, we had many patients who were still reluctant to come in. And so we learned how, how important and how critical reassurance is. And we did that through the letters that I mentioned, as well as the phone call follow-up, and then to uh, reassure them in person when they arrived in the parking lot or arrived into our office. Second, we all recognized, uh, as I'm sure you're aware, that the uh, presence of dementia and its progression does not stall during a pandemic. And so we tried to reduce the wait times to come into the clinic as much as we could. That was part of the reason that we felt very strongly about getting them up and running as quickly as we could when it was safe to do so. Uh, more so, perhaps, for the family caregivers who knew they were seeing changes in their loved one and really wanted to connect with us and get um, linkage to some additional resources and services. Third, we realized that um, we have to be flexible in what works best for the individuals that we're serving and for the team members that are providing that service. And then having virtual programs in place or considering transitioning to virtual, to virtual uh, really is important um, because it's instrumental in helping us reach more individuals in the community. So would we learned that it is important to be open to new platforms. Um, yes, we've all experienced some Zoom fatigue or burnout. Um, perhaps our family caregivers have as well. Um, but we want to really put on our creative hat, be open to these platforms, and to be sure to gather input from program participants while we're developing and testing uh, these new online platforms. I have a slide with just a few references that you will be able to access with the uh, copy of the slides today. My contact information within the Riverside Health System. And at this time, I am pleased to pass it to my colleague, Maria Ordonez. Maria? Thank you, Christy, for your wonderful and informative presentation and, and for our ongoing collaboration. I learned so much from you, and um, especially today as well. And I just wanted to take a moment to thank uh, Sari and Betsy and Erin for your kind introductions and invitation. And thank you to everyone listening today and participating in this webinar. And our ability to maintain services and support for people, people living with dementia and their caregivers during COVID-19 is due in great part, like Christy mentioned, to the financial and programmatic support of the US Department of Health and Human Services Administration for Community Living and you'll see that abbreviated as ACL. And this is a disclaimer that is indicating that the information that I will share comes from our experience, findings, and conclusions, and do not necessarily represent official policy. And the takeaways that I hope that you will get from attending this presentation are to describe ways that an ACL program, grant-funded, nurse-led model of dementia-specific care and supportive services created and maintained virtual adult day services and support for persons living with dementia. And you will see it abbreviated as TLWD and their caregivers, a CG abbreviation, during COVID-19. And also to identify culturally appropriate technology-assisted interventions for diverse family caregivers of persons living with dementia and during you know, this COVID-19 pandemic. And this is uh, where I am not right now. Um, this is our lead agency as, as one of the grantees. Um, is the Lewis and Ann Green Memory and Wellness Center of the Christine Eileen College of Nursing 
which consists of a state-designated memory disorder clinic and an Alzheimer's disease specialized adult day center as designated by the Agency for Healthcare Administration. And we are located on the Boca Raton campus of Florida Atlantic University in southeastern Florida. And our innovative nurse-led model is grounded in caring science, which is the foundational philosophy and theory that guides our practice, research, teaching, and also service. And one of our main core values of this philosophy is interconnectedness and co-creating healing environments. And uh, the importance of community and connectedness was also highlighted in Christy's presentation. Um, we have a person, family, community-centered partnering approach to care that is culturally and linguistically responsive with an interprofessional team-based education and practice model. And, and I have the great honor of being the director of this wonderful healing place and also one of the clinicians. And this is our mission here, which is to meet the complex needs of persons with memory disorders and their family members. Um, like Christy said, it is you know, a, a diet approach uh, through a comprehensive array of individualized, compassionate, and innovative programs of care, reflecting best practice, research, and education to help maintain function, delay decline, and promote well-being and quality of life. Beyond the Brick and Mortar Then and Now presents our journey through the grant program that enabled us to expand our specialized services beyond the physical space of the center to the community. And we titled it Bridging the Gap, Providing Specialized Dementia Care and Supportive Services Through Community Partnerships. And because we were able to bridge the gap, building trust to open access to these dementia-specific services uh, and support since 2015, we've been able to adapt and maintain support for the communities we serve during the pandemic. Um, and I know we're all very familiar, unfortunately, with the language. But just presented here um, is the expanded and abbreviated version of COVID-19. And our target population include person living with or at risk for ADRD, including those living with intellectual disabilities and developmental disabilities and their family caregivers. And I should say that ADRD is Alzheimer's disease and related dementia. And also aging persons living alone or with a caregiver and aging persons from unserved and underserved communities, including Spanish and Haitian Creole speaking populations. Our goals include improving health outcomes, such as quality of life, expanding access to dementia-specialized services, building on existing and community-based services and support, existing home and community-based services and support, and because we built such a strong bridge and had the support and guidance of ACL, we were able to respond to the call to care by providing telehealth and virtual services to address emerging concerns and the impact of COVID-19 pandemic on, on persons living with ADRD and their family caregivers. And um, Christy already discussed um, the memory cafe, so I, I won't spend too much time on this. Just sharing the picture here where you can see our memory cafe in action, and certainly this is in pre-COVID times. And um, this is our Haitian Creole faith-based community actively engaged in a fun physical activity. And uh, this is more on the history of Memory Cafe, so we move on. Uh, with this slide, I want to share the similarities and uniqueness of two of our ethnically diverse community partners, both faith-based, engaging with each community within their own culture and communicating in their own language, Haitian Creole and Spanish, we learn that building trust within each community facilitated opening conversations about risks for Alzheimer's disease and related dementia to begin reducing the cultural stigma about dementia that exists in this population. And sharing and gaining understanding and knowledge of self and others through caring, connecting, and engaging, strengthening their sense of community and our partnership with each community. 
and the power of social connection uh, was demonstrated through developing this memory cafe inspired activities and we called tete a tete um, or meaning head to head uh, which is a private or intimate conversation intentionally created between two people that's uh, the meaning of tete a tete in the Haitian Creole community and also the Ministerio Hispano Cafe or Hispanic Ministry Cafe for our Hispanic Spanish speaking communities. And as the entire world has experienced, this global pandemic has had a huge impact right in, in the way we live, communicate, and relate with each other. We promote now and practice social physical distancing instead of closeness. We went from social connection to social isolation. And for persons living with Alzheimer's disease or related dementia and their caregivers, their daily challenges have now been compounded with the onset of this global pandemic, which exacerbates social isolation and loneliness already experienced by this population, um, you know, for both person and the caregivers. And in addition, studies show that Hispanic, Latino, and Haitian Caribbean populations are particularly and disproportionately affected by both dementia and COVID-19 and this contributes to exponential risk for loneliness and overall decline. And um, responding to the call to care for our team was possible through telehealth and telemedicine. And Christy, you know, explained a lot of the adaptations that we have already also adapted into our clinic side. Um, and I'm focusing, of course, um, on my presentation more on the supportive services and also our adult day center services. Um, you know, the, the traditional support groups that met in person were canceled and home services curtailed. And so in response to the call to care and to alleviate these additional stressors, our center created these innovative ways to maintain supportive services, offering information and communication virtually and we actually noted a higher consistent attendance uh, at the virtual meetings. We reached the Hispanic, Latino, and Afro-Caribbean populations through our faith-based community partners. And um, I just wanted to mention that telehealth and telemedicine are two different types um, of online health care services, where telemedicine refers specifically to online doctor or, or health care provider clinical visits, the telehealth also includes health-related education and services like diabetes management or nutrition courses and health-related or dementia-specific training, for example. And our COVID-19 adapted dementia services and support include learning about telehealth and technology. And we learn from other clinics and organizations like Christie's and also adapting adult day services to our virtual programs. Um, we offer word games, music, trivia, converting existing supportive services to the virtual platform, and creating culturally appropriate technology-assisted support groups and self-preservation activities that we call spa days. We've been checking in with families via phone calls, text messages, and emails, offering resources. And also we sent out a letter in June and July to our day center families sharing the resources um, that our center has available as well as keeping them informed you know, on our reopening status. Um, we also sent home packets for day center participants to do activities at home. And also hurricane preparedness mailing to all the day center families. Um, also robotic pets and MP3 players that are offered through the state um, and throughout all these efforts, we've had to ensure that our virtual platforms, such as WebEx, um, are HIPAA compliant. And this is, you know, in order to protect, of course, the health information of the participants um, or patients. And one of our ACL effective models demonstrating the power of social connection during the pandemic was created to maintain critically needed support and education that was linguistically and culturally appropriate. And this was based on our memory cafe connections and collaborations, um, connecting Creole-speaking 
patient older adults through telephonic engagement is one of these programs. We've had biweekly support groups and the, me the Memory and Wellness Center teleconference phone line was um, provided and the majority of the participants had no internet connection or the technology necessary to participate in this web-based support group. So, you know, we decided, of course, that the telephonic meetings were the preferred and most accessible way of connecting for this community. And our facilitator was a Haitian Creole speaking psychiatric mental health nurse practitioner student who participated also in the tete-a-tete -tete encounters. And um, you see here how they, you know, had the, the meetings, opening prayers, song, and sharing individual concerns regarding social isolation and also stress related to the pandemic and caring for loved ones. We've had 21 to 25 unduplicated individuals in 64 sessions since March of 2020. And this is our second ACL effective model derived um, from our Hispanic faith-based community partnership, the Ministerio Hispano Virtual Support Group. Um, and these meetings are weekly on Friday from 2 to 3 p.m. And at this, you know, for these uh, meetings, we do use the WebEx video and audio. And facilitators include our community care coordinator, Spanish-speaking staff, and myself and any students that we have available um, that we train to assist as well. And um, similar format, they open with a guided medication, reflection, and then sharing individual concerns um, regarding their social isolation and stress related to their caregiving role. We've uh, served 45 unduplicated individuals and 20 sessions since May 2020. Now, our day center virtual program started on June 10th, and um, you know we have the person and family center approach. We initiated this process uh, by contacting um, you know all of the day center families to ask them if they would be interested in the activities. And for those who declined, we offered to send out the monthly packet um, that I mentioned earlier, and we also sent out an email blast asking them to go complete a survey and to guide our programming in terms of what activities and their preferences in terms of time um, and how often they prefer them. And so um, their feedback um, you know, is, is used to adjust our activities accordingly. Um, like I mentioned, the person and family center virtual activities include the caregiver and are cognitively stimulating, meaningful, fun, and engaging the five senses. Um, and um, Eight to 12 participants attend regularly all the, the, you know, the activities during the week. And so far, we've served a total of 55 unduplicated individuals since we began the virtual program. And we also send an email to all families each Sunday afternoon with the schedule for the upcoming week and as a reminder. In this photo, you see one of our virtual day center activities um, we've had permission uh, to show this, this picture. Um, and in this case are the chair exercises. Um, you know, even though you cannot see all the details here, we can tell that the participants are actively engaged and communicate with the staff uh, who's leading the class. I mentioned our sustaining the caregiver program and also has been translated to virtual. Um, and this program offers educational activities for family caregivers. Um, Yesterday, our November virtual spa day took place at 4 p.m. And our topic was um, Reboot Your Brain, Mental Well-Being Through Relaxation and Sleep. And um, we had our first Spanish spa also last night, um, evening at 6 p.m. And um, we have had many challenges that we have encountered and learned from as well. Um, you know, our caregivers not being able to connect sometimes due to limited computer knowledge, but not only the caregivers, um, but our team also. You know, we have had to learn to adapt best practices to provide care. And our caregivers, you know, sometimes have uh, lost interest in attending because they prefer in-person interaction. And sometimes the WebEx is not a user-friendly for older adults. And most of the caregivers share that they prefer Zoom over WebEx. Um, the login process can be a little challenging and depends on what device you're using. Um, you know, we've had to take time, of course, to assist with technological issues 
and some caregivers have not been able to attend because their loved ones are home and privacy is an issue. Um, in addition, some caregivers have shared that they do not feel comfortable with the virtual support groups because they do not want others viewing their personal space, so lack of privacy. Now, I have to tell you that this is improving greatly as caregivers are learning and loving the feature of you know, that changing the virtual background uh, to help with this challenge. Um, and definitely, sustainability continues to be an important challenge. We no longer have the revenue of the in-person day center fees, um, and our virtual programs are free of charge. And so for sustainability of our programs, it's important to have buy-in support from within, you know, from our memory and wellness center team. And I do have an amazing team that I'm grateful for every day. Uh, the support also of the participants, the community, funding sources such as ACL and the Florida Department of Elder Affairs, and um, billable services as well, um, you know, to sustain our overall operation in-person and virtual clinic visits, uh, telehealth included, are critical. Um, and then our ongoing fu fundraising efforts. Um, and we have um, Caring Hearts Auxiliary, who are volunteer entity that assists with our fundraising, and the Boca Raton Regional Hospital Community Outreach Grant, and we recently received um, $50,000, and we remain grateful to all of the donors and the community. These are some of the testimonials, um, participants and caregivers experience decreased social isolation as they report, enjoy seeing each other during group, loved ones smile and enjoy day center activities, improve skills on caring for self, and also a sense of accomplishment through learning new skills and technology. And we have had many successes as well uh, in our programming. Uh, we believe that we're transforming dementia care through embracing caring and technology. We have increased awareness of unique challenges persons living with dementia and caregivers face during pandemic and other personal and public health threats. We have increased access to dementia services and support for the homebound. We have enhanced continuity of care and education, expanded access to diverse populations, provided cognitive stimulation, integrated student practicum experiences, and participants who travel north during the summer continue to participate in our support group. So that has been uh, a good experience for everybody. And we've had two participants um, in the Hispanic support group that have joined from Central and South America. So um, you know the impact of our services and support has had international reach. And this can have great benefits in the lives of persons living with ADRD, their caregivers, and also their communities. And in this final slide, I present our COVID-19 adapted caregiver program by the numbers. So from April to September 2020, we see here that we have provided dementia-specific supportive services to 314 family caregivers, over 1,856 encounters. And you can see the numbers for the other services that include the telehealth counseling, therapy services, and virtual support groups, as well as our virtual day center check-in. Um, and, and I just want to end by saying that telehealth innovations present a promising new era for dementia care and caregiving. And by reaching people in their homes, these technologies can help address health inequities for families that live in rural areas and also for those in other underserved and unserved communities who otherwise could not access care and support. Um, these are many of my references. Um, and I want to thank you. Uh, I think Mercy, I don't know if I pronounced that correctly. And um, gracias. Uh, and this is my contact information. Thank you. Thank you uh, so much, there. Maria. Thank you so much. Thank you, Christy. Thank you, Maria. Your presentations were very informative. And we have some questions coming in that we will um, get to. Just as a reminder, you can put your questions into the question and answer pod of the webinar platform. 
And you'll also see a slide up giving you some information about how to track um, information about new announcements related to Alzheimer's disease programs initiative. So we'll get to the questions and um, we'll do this so I can, I'll read out the questions to the presenters and they'll answer orally for all of you to hear what they have to say. Um, so we had a question um, that both of you can answer a little bit about, you know, how, how do you manage situations when clients, um, and caregivers or people living with dementia may be reluctant to participate with virtual technologies? Are there any strategies you've come up with to engage them um, or other options that may be available besides um, the use of the screen technology? Well, thanks, Sari. This is Christy. I'll start, and then I'll pass it to uh, Maria. So I think I think about this in several ways. With our memory cafe and transitioning that to a virtual cafe, that we had a coordinator. Um, she's actually a consultant to our project, not a not an internal team member to our health system. But we had a coordinator who's just so invested in the memory cafe that she was willing to go above and beyond to really teach herself. Uh, the technology. And so I think first recognizing the reluctance that our own colleagues might have, Maria mentioned that, um, as well as the reluctance that family members have, and, and as Maria mentioned, the privacy issues. So, um, you know, our coordinator for the virtual cafe said, no pressure. We'll do a pen pal program if you don't feel comfortable, but we're really going to encourage you to just try it. And maybe you ask an adult child or a grandchild and try it, try it with them. Uh, we use Zoom um, for the Memory Cafe platform. And the coordinator would offer to test it with them before an actual cafe meeting uh, was scheduled. Um, we also tried to offer very simple instructions, step by step with photo images. Um, and to provide some incentives. So the memory cafes have actually been opened up beyond a regional um, opportunity now to family members that live out of state. And so we thought that might provide an incentive to our participants to say, you can see relatives that live far away and um, they can join this cafe uh, as well. Um, but we did realize that some persons living with dementia weren't comfortable on camera also, and so we encourage the caregiver to just turn the camera off, make sure they kept their audio on um, when needed. Um, and, and as Maria said, it was fun to have folks explore changing their backgrounds to something that was more, you know, more meaningful or exciting for them. We've also learned another incentive was to start the cafe, uh, virtual cafe, with a key activity. Like when you come to the next cafe and you sign on at 11 a.m. next Tuesday, be sure you're wearing your favorite hat. Uh, something like that that would just provide folks with a little bit of kind of curiosity about what that program was going to offer. Um, and, and I'll just make a few more comments about our microlearning because that's targeted for family caregivers and we've also seen some reluctance in them embracing those uh, free educational tools that we feel are very beneficial. Um, so we are driving family caregivers to that e-learning platform, but then we realize that we need to make that platform as simple and accessible as possible and encourage them to keep coming back each week. So now we're building in more touch points to say thanks for completing the first lesson or two, but we want to continue to have you come back again uh, to complete all of these lessons. So that's really been um, a focused effort for us. And Maria, I'll pass it to you. Oh, thank you, Christy. Um, you know, your answer was very, very comprehensive, and um, I think that, you know, you presented key elements of the effort. Um, I could add that involving, right, the participants and their family members in the decision whether, you know, they're more comfortable with, uh, for example, in our case, you know, the, the virtual support groups. Um, we have one of our groups that are that is, you know, telephone only, um, and another group which is, you know, WebEx. Uh, base. So um, having them, you know, be part of that decision and encouraging them, you know, and like, like Christy said, um, you know, no pressure. And what we also do is that before any meeting, um, you know, we open the floor, the platform, um, like 30 minutes earlier. Um, and that way if somebody wants to come in and they need assistance, you know, with the sound, um, so there is a lot of preparation. And the same thing happens with the day center activities. Um, you know, we are uh, on, on, on the meeting, like, 
30 minutes before, and that way, you know, we can have, um, you know, a conversation or call anybody who is uh, presenting with difficulties. Um, and so, you know, we say that our efforts, you know, not only need to be now culturally and linguistically appropriate, but also technologically adapted to the specific group. So, um, you know, of course, this, this is um, challenging. Um, and like Christy said, and I explained that, you know, it's been a learning um, experience for us and, um, and, and also to our, you know, wonderful, not, not surprise, because, you know, um, our, our community, you know, is so resilient. However, you know, they're so open to learning um, and also celebrating their own achievements. But um, no question about it that many times, you know, there is frustration at the same time. And so that's why, you know, we're there as support. Um, and also, of course, we cannot offer the in-person virtual support group. But for example, for the clinic, if somebody prefers to come in, then we reassure them, you know, with our flyers and with our packets that we send home, um, you know, in preparation, including the step-by-step -step, um, instructions, which, you know, they could be on paper, but we walk them through um, ourselves, you know, if it's a video call or also on the telephone. So thank you for, for the question as well. Sari, this is Christy. I was just going to add one quick uh, story, success story, even in the in the reluctance with technology question, um, is that we had a, a husband caring for his wife with memory loss, and they had regularly attended one of our memory cafes in a library, and they were very upset to learn when the library was closed, and we had a few months of transition until we moved to the virtual cafe, and it, the first session was scheduled. Um, he had an opportunity to practice. He felt fairly comfortable with linking into Zoom and having his camera on. What happened was that um, he explained to his wife that they were going to be seeing their friends from the library, but they were going to be able to do it from home. Um, she went back to her bedroom, laid down, ended up falling asleep, taking a nap about 10 minutes before the Zoom session for the cafe was supposed to start. And the husband came back on with the coordinator and the other dyads and said, is it okay if I still join you all? Uh, my wife is laid down. She's asleep. There's really no reason for me to wake her up. And, of course, the uh, coordinator and the dyads were welcome to have him, and he was able to fully engage for about 45 minutes in that cafe and was welcomed by everyone, even though his wife uh, that he was caring for wasn't able to be with him. And the other thing that he shared was that it had the cafe been at the library and had she gone back in and laid down to take a nap, then they both would have missed the cafe. So this allowed him a little bit more flexibility to still participate. And just I just thought that was a really nice story to share. Yeah, that's great. And actually a nice segue to the next question, which is someone has asked, um, when you think about programs that you offered in person prior to the pandemic, are there any programs that are now virtual that you think may be better or improved on an online experience? Or are there aspects of it that are better? You mentioned, um, one of you mentioned, you know, involving family members from other states and things like that. So can you talk a little bit about some of the advantages to the virtual programming? This is Maria. Um, yes, um, certainly, you know, the accessibility, right, that um, if persons that are homebound cannot, you know, come to the groups, I think that that opens, uh, you know, access to care, um, you know, persons that otherwise could not, you know, be in person. Um, and, of course, like you mentioned, you know, um, from out of state and also even, you know, out of the country. Um, there are people that have family members, um, you know, in another country, and so we can connect, you know. So, so there are connections, you know, new connections being made also, um, you know, through the virtual world as well. Um, nonetheless, you know, again, you know, some people prefer the in-person. Um, however, you know, I see some advantages. Um, another advantage that I could um, present is also the billable aspect of, of our, you know, practice um, that has, you know, expanded also to new opportunities. Um, so that as well, you know, is, is, is a positive. 
And this is Christy. I think for us, it's really, um, it has opened up some new opportunities, and we're trying to stay flexible and just keep, keep these options open, really kind of thinking creatively and innovatively about how uh, online platforms can keep us connected. And um, realizing, again, that we all can kind of feel some fatigue around that, um, so trying to design programs that are going to be uh, meaningful and a good use of individuals' time. Um, and uh, as I mentioned before, with, um, with our, uh, both our microlearning and our memory cafe, um, and uh, perhaps now with some of our other programs, I think we're, we're going to, I don't think those virtual options are going to be taken off the menu. So even once we all successfully get past this pandemic, I think we'll continue. I just think there will be family members and persons living with memory loss that um, will like that option and that flexibility. And so I think it's going to um, present some new opportunities for us as service providers uh, to, to expand our menu and keep it expanded to uh, these kinds of options. We're already talking about how our medication review can be provided. Um, via uh, telehealth. Uh, so um, we, we're thankful for the opportunities, and again, we're also recognizing that uh, our team members, our own staff, are going to have to have to learn these tools along with the individuals that we serve. Great. Thank you so much. Um, can you talk a little bit about any collaborative partner organizations that you've worked with with um, these programs that you've talked about, whether it's directly um, as helping to implement the programs or if it's been through, you know, helping you get participants or marketing, I mean, any, any specific collaborative partners you want to mention and what their roles have been? Well, I'll just share real briefly and then pass it to Maria. Um, I think she and I both have in common a strong relationship with our area agencies on aging um, and religious organizations. So. Um, those have, have been critical to us in us making them aware of our expanded clinic services, our online learning platforms, the memory cafe, things of that nature, so that they can share with the clients and families that they serve. So they've really become um, an even stronger referral partner. And then likewise, if the Area Agency on Aging has services that they're providing, including home delivered meals, that we can then refer our clients to. So it's really worked well both ways for uh, referrals and support. Um, and I would also add that um, the Alzheimer's Association uh, has been a, a, a good partner of ours as well. Yes, we're similar. Um, yes, thank you. Very, very similar, you know, as, as Christy is mentioning. And also, you know, through the Florida Department of Elder Affairs, um, you know, we connect through the network of the other 16. There are 17 memory disorder clinics. And, um, you know, we're in, we are communicating and, and meeting more frequently. And there is a dementia care and cure initiative within the state. Um, and um, one of the uh, memory care co coordinators and myself co-chair the Palm Beach uh, Task Force, which, you know, we'll be meeting tomorrow morning. And uh, there we have invited business owners, um, first responders, um, anyone in the community who, you know, um, represents um, meeting the needs of persons with dementia and their caregivers. And so we are creating, you know, a network of resources. And also, for example, if, you know, one has developed a training on, um, you know, dementia sensitivity training, then we share that. And so it, it's about collaboration. And, and, of course, in my presentation, I explained about the faith-based communities. Um, so. So we're bringing the community in now where we were out, you know, to the community before. So um, maintaining those connections and expanding, um, you know, people are really, really um, excited to be connected, and they need to be connected because of the, you know, implications of isolation. So, um, and of course, you know, without the collaboration of ACL, um, and the guidance and everything that we have learned, and of course the funding, we couldn't do what we do. Um, and in addition, I have to say that um, you know the, the intentionality and, and the wanting to care for this population that, that lives within our teams is also a, a very important ingredient in this formula. So thank you very much. 
Thank you so much. Well, we've just about run out of time. I want to thank Christy and Maria for their presentations and their participation today. And I want to thank all of you in attendance for participating with the National Alzheimer's and Dementia Resource Center webinar series. We hope you'll join us for our next webinar on January 13th, 2021, Reaching Socially Isolated People Living with Dementia. The registration information for that webinar can be found on the American Society on Aging's website, and we'll ho we hope you'll join us again soon. I'll turn things back to Betsy for some final remarks. Thanks so much, Sarah, and thanks for this great presentation. If you'd like to claim CEUs for today's webinar, you'll be receiving a follow-up email by the end of the business day that will contain a link to the CEU application. That email will also contain a link where you can download today's slides. You'll have 60 days to claim CEUs, and it will take 30 days from the date of your submission in order for us to process and issue your CE credits. Thank you, everyone, for joining us today. Have a great rest of your day.